What are you? Why? 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 <laughs> we're on, by the way. We're on. We're recording. Oh, okay. What I'm using there is you were trying to uh, you were trying to cross your legs with yeah. me. Have you got big fat thighs that you can't do it? Or like is it the jeans? What stopped you? Crossing it's just your legs what's bit? between my uh, <laughs> legs, mate. <laughs> like, why you? Why, why you? Why you been in the coffee? Uh, because I don't need it. I don't need caffeine, do I? I need water. I need food. I don't need caffeine. What I'm trying to do is get to the state where if I'm flagging, I then go, oh, I'll have a cup of coffee because it's got caffeine in it. It'll give me that, that caffeine hit that I need. Whereas opposed to if I'm eating, eating, if I'm drinking coffee on a regular basis, you don't get that caffeine hit because you're used to it. It makes sense, doesn't it? Why would you be flagging though? See, I'm of the opinion these days, I've, in fact, that I've just realised and pro- may have just formed this opinion as you were talking then, right? I was thinking, see, if, if people, I'm not suggesting this is you, no. but if people, if you have someone who, was fl- who like flags during the day, a normal day, normal work, even if you've done fitness, right, maybe in the morning or mm-hmm. whatever, and if you start flagging in terms of mental acuity, mental focus, or physical like energy, if you're flagging in a normal day, that's, that's not right. You need to change your diet. <laughs> you shouldn't need coffee for that. But I'm guessing with you it's to do with the the nature and type of work that you do and the length of time that you work for, maybe. No, it's far more simple. It's your circ- circadian rhythm. So your circadian rhythm, your body, your energy levels ebb and flow throughout the day. And in mid-afternoon, that's when your energy... Lo- you're shaking your head. This is science, Hugh. <laughs> Look, we... Do not make me reference the base level infantry crayon eating. <laughs> oh, oh there's, a, be- there's a serious. I know, I know, I know. Do you know what? Do you know why I shake my head? Is I don't experience that. I don't. Um, uh, I don't experience that. Really? But I, I, I know. I know of the circadian rhythm. Yeah. I, edu- I'm, educate me, please, on the circadian rhythm. Oh, crack it. Right. Well, I, I can't educate, but I will. I will gently inform. Basically, your body will go. Same fucking thing. Yeah, but to educate would would mean that I'm I'm an expert in it. It's not. Anyway, right, I digress. Up and down, your energy levels go throughout the day. And sometimes when your energy levels are down, usually kind of post-lunch, you'll be back at work and you kind of need to refocus. And a caffeine hit, if you do not regularly drink caffeine, will give you that slight spike in, uh, I don't know, mental agility or alertness. Uh, a, what I'm saying is you don't need it. No, you don't need it, no. But that's what, it, it helps. There, there's a lot of, we don't need many things, you. but caffeine does exist. It's like, right, we're going down a rabbit hole here. <laughs> it no, it's, no, it's interesting, it's an interesting topic. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I you don't need yeah. it is. So I'm, try, no, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to get you know off. what I didn't tell you before, on, pocket, what? we shouldn't talk over each other. Right. But go on. No, after you. It's terrible listening. It's really bad. It's really poor for people listening. It was my fault. I spoke. You were looking like I told you off. I'm not telling you off. I was, <laughs> I was talking over you as much as you were talking over me. Right. You were the guest. Talk away. <laughs> I, I thought that, that you were going to stop, so I carried on. Um, I don't even know where we are now. Coffee. Yeah, I'm trying to get off it. Simple as. And then eventually I'll try and wean myself off tea. But I'm not giving tea up. I, I know what you mean. There's a lot of caffeine in it, though. Yeah. I've been I've been coffee three three weeks ago. Right. Um, initially, I said I'm been in caffeine, but I thought I'm going to bring coffee and just so just, literally just so I allow myself. If I fancy if I fancy a brew in the morning, mm. I can have a brew in the morning, and yeah. it's like oh. And plus, you can't. If I was to say I am I am been in caffeine forever, or just setting myself a, an unachievable goals, I'd be miserable. One, I like mm. to indulge. In, it's like everything in moderation, including moderation. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the reason I've been to office <clears throat> last few months, uh, focus, attention has gotten worse than what it normally is. It's normally quite, it's normally not where I would like it to be, but I mean, it's got horrendous, really poor. Um, and it just, it just, it hasn't, it, that kind of, that sort of mental aspect, like symptom of something, it has a holistic impact on me, like it does everyone. Mm. So if I'm struggling to focus at work, then that makes me stressed. And it, and if I not I've got if I haven't got a handle on what I'm doing hour by hour day to day I'm not because I can't focus on things that makes me stressed so it's been back seven I thought okay because three years ago no five five years ago now someone had suggested to me when I was in a really poor state of affairs I tried like one of the things you could try as a part of all of your measures that you're trying to do is bin caffeine and I bin caffeine within 
24, 36 hours, I was like a different fucking man. Like, I was really, I had real mental clarity. I was really surprised. So I did it again this time. The impact hasn't has been as big, but it has been a, there's been a big impact, not as big as the first time. But you know what I did get this time? Withdrawal symptoms. Didn't have that last time. I had 24 hours of headache. And what, and, uh, and I also was feeling nauseous all day. But I, I didn't realise the nausea, nausea thing until about a week later. Because I had woke up in the morning. I'd mentioned to my missus, got a banging headache. And I thought my nausea was down to, I'd eaten something the day before. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, oh, thinking about that is making me nauseous. It wasn't. It was withdrawal symptoms from the caffeine. Mm. Um... And now we're both, we're both decaf wankers this morning, aren't we? Decaf coffee wankers. Well, I mean, it's one step away from veganism, which I know <laughs> Ben Gar would are we going absolutely there, are we? love. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, do you drink Monster or any of that stuff? Stick it up your ass. Nah, terrible. The, however, the, the re- however the, go on. 81 power drink, do good water bottles. Well, it's, it's, it's an alley-looking water give, bottle. Give him a friend, Jenny, Mc, nice. Jenny McGill, give me that. Yeah, yeah it's very, very nice. good water bottle. Um, the key ingredient... If I was going to drink a power drink, I'd drink it you one, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> the key ingredient in things like Monster that are so bad for you is taurine. And air crew are, are effectively... They're not banned, but they are highly, highly discouraged from drinking it. Go on. So basically, it will shoot your... Your kind of like your your sugar levels, your alertness, like bang, like it does, like it advertises. Red Bull gives you wing, etc. But the crash can be significant. So if you were to, for instance, go up on a sortie, having just drunk a whole can of Red Bull or Monster, fifteen minutes, half an hour before, an hour into that sortie, you might go, <sighs> you'll feel that energy drop. Whereas if you hadn't drunk it and just had a glass of water probably have a more stable alertness so it's reducing that um that up down up down the the extremes of it um yeah and it's laced with sugar makes your teeth fuzzy so there you go yeah i had uh i, I was driving from uh, uh wales to london one morning i had a hangover and i was a red bull man at the time i uh drank oh, i don't god knows uh, maybe five or six red bulls on the way <laughs> And I had a couple of coffees in the way. I was going to see my girlfriend at the time. And, oh, man, I, I got there and I, I didn't know what was happening. You can see I, sounds. I, I didn't know what was happening, mate. I was sat on a couch. I wanted to uh, I wanted to sleep and crash. Uh, but at the same time, I couldn't stop moving. I was like, <laughs> And again, I had a nausea. I was in. I was like, fuck, I'm never doing that again. Completely overdid the caffeine. Just yeah. Smashed me. But, yeah, I agree. The energy drinks, man. Kids, <laughs> don't <laughs> chink them. They're flipping horrendous. My, my daughter, my youngest daughter, she, she, I walked in the room. Um, she'd been out the shops with her friends, and she, and she had there was two cans of you know the tall cans of yeah. Monster empty against her wall, right? And she's she's oh, how old is she now? Twelve, right? I said, uh, yes, mate, exactly. Megan Amelia. James Griffin is pulling fists at you. She doesn't <laughs> listen to this. I don't know why I'm talking to her, right? She doesn't listen to this. Um, but uh, yeah, she said, I said, what are, those, what are those there for? So I knew she drank them. I wasn't, that wasn't the point it was going to make. Yeah. Like, what are those there for? Oh, I'm going to make a monster wall. What do you mean? So she wanted to make a wall. She had two cans there, and her intention was to make a wall of cans. That's cool. She's seen it on YouTube or Instagram or something. A wall of monster cans in the bedroom. Oh Mate, God. that's a lot of cans of monster. It's like, oh, you do not understand, what you're, doing. You don't understand what you're doing. But um, so the, the, the can has got chucked in the bin. She was not happy. Uh, are, mate, we, are we recording? Yeah, I told you that. Oh, excellent. Yeah, uh, mate, it's great to have in the studio. I've been excited for this one because I know you're a, you're a strange man. <laughs> strange man. <laughs> that's fair. What's Hard. going on in your life? What's going on in your life? Tell me. Talk oh to me. Oh, my God, mate. Um, that's a strong question. What's going on in my life? All right. Yeah, let, let's be brutally honest. I went for uh, I went for a job interview on Wednesday this week. So what have I done this week? I went for a job interview to be a postman, and I didn't get it. <laughs> what are you laughing for, Hugh? That's that's the reaction you wanted. That's it's the reaction you, I expected. Yeah, and that you wanted. You wouldn't have told <laughs> that. You wouldn't have told that little story no. like that if you hadn't. Go on. No, so, I told. What's the point you're making of that story, though? It's okay to fail. I just wanted to know what your reaction to that would be. 
Um, why? No, 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 mate. What? Why are we going? F- why are we changing jobs? What a slower pace of life. I say that, and then I consistently fail to find something that gives me a slower pace of life. Um, I quite like having a bit of an adventurous life, but then sometimes I go, "You really need to stop living out of a bag. You need to slow things down." So find something that allows you to do that. So I found a postman vacancy in my local area. I was like, I'm going for that. Free fees, definitely more than 10,000 steps a day. Gives me time to do things in the side. You know, you usually have a, it's early start. We're used to that. Um, relatively early finish. Get home, loads of time to do stuff. Pays the bills. Doing stuff in the community. Went for the interview. I thought, I am going to smash this. Quietly confident, knowing there would be other people for it. But I came out thinking, <clears throat> that went quite well. Yeah, got with him really well. Tried not to let my ego get in there. Because your ego's like, yeah, you've got this. I got the email yesterday. Unfortunately, you did pass the interview, but there were other people who scored more highly. I was like, who? Tim Peake? <laughs> <laughs> but then it was like, no, that's fair. And so you reset your expectations. And it was a, it was a bit of a swift kick to the nuts. And... And in a life of where you go, I'm going to set this goal and I'm going to achieve it, and then you get used to it, something like that, you go, I didn't see, I didn't want to see past that because I really wanted that. And now I have to look elsewhere. And so I am doing. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to go to the interview. This is the angle I'm trying to look at it from. Um, So yeah, so I am doing. And I'm happy to share that. Good. Mate, it's mega. It's, it's okay like, to fail. It's, yeah, but not that. It's like you, you're taking a fucking sensible approach of the the job. See, people put everything into the job and, and see, and a lot of times see the job as that is the that is what makes you tick. You know, that is what's going to give you my satisfaction in life. They do, whether they realise it or not. And I think you're in a state of mind where I, or I'm, I'm, I've got you later than you. I'm trying to get there. Is where the the job is is the is the enabler for the things I want to do. The job pays the bills, provides me my fun money, so I can do this stuff and everything. Will, but if that means the job is the priority because without the job, there's not no financial income. Oh, in, financial income, income's obviously the priority. Mm. And you have to. It doesn't. It doesn't mean put everything to your job and do well at it and give it focus and energy that you should do because you should want to do it. You should hopefully you enjoy your job. I mean, very few people do, but hopefully you do. Um, and it's 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 what helps you do what you want to do. What um, it surprised me though. I didn't realise you do a change. So, hmm. are you allowed to talk about your previous job? Not really. Okay, let's not talk about that. Talk- I can speak about the stuff I did six months beforehand. Um, yeah, and so it's, right, so I just want to, I, I, if you'll allow me, I'd like to pick up on something you just said, the job is the priority, is the job the priority? Because the priority is defined by the individual, for me, my priority is to be happy, and to put a roof over my head and put food on the table, the job, if I can enjoy it, is ideal, but the real priority is where do I want to be? What is this a step in order for me to get to? I think I meant what I meant was as a as a resource, like the most the most the critical resource it's is, critical. is a yeah. job. It's like that is because the job gives you the again, your food, mm. your clothing, your means to travel and and the opportunity to afford if it needs to be paid for. Whatever you like to do in your spare time, yeah. because not everything needs paying for, right? Yeah, yeah. And then purpose. I need a purpose. I went for the Royal Mail job because it's purposeful. It's doing something in the community. My postman is one of the highlights of my day. When I'm working from home and he rocks up, the dog goes bananas, I know there's post arriving. But he also has a massive smile on his face. And he makes everybody else on the street smile because he's dead cheery. <clears throat> if you can bring that to someone every day by doing a really important job, such as delivering mail, because let's face it, that's an important job. There's no two ways about it. Then why, could you, why, not, why not aspire to do that? And I aspired, and I didn't get there. But you never know. We'll 
We'll see what comes next. What are you looking for now then? I'm hoping that I'm hoping that Jim is going to give me another job. <laughs> so I went to see um I uh I went to see a, a really good friend the other day, um a friend of both yours and ours, um uh at my former employer Mission Motorsport, who are an amazing organization and have amazing uh things coming in the near future. And continue to do fantastic work. And obviously, as you know, I used to work for Mission Motorsport. You're on about Jim, as in a mutual friend, Jim? Yeah. Right, okay. Jim Cameron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering why you didn't say his name. I did. I said Jim. Yeah. All right, All right sorry. James Cameron, Mission Motorsport. Right, yeah. um, probably the most fanatical petrol head I've ever met in my life. Um, and, yeah, so I went to, to, to see him, obviously, because uh, conditions have allowed us to. Um, and actually... He said, he said, you know, it's it's really nice to see you. I said, it's lovely to see you. He went, I know you're also here because you're looking for work. And I was <laughs> like, ah, it's seen through my ruse. Uh, but no, it was um, it was really nice to see him. And, uh, and when you hear things that they've got in the pipeline, it's like, I need to be a part of this. I need to be a part of it because it's such good work. It's so important to a community that, obviously both you and I and so many others care about and doing it in a way that gets people engaged, gets people enthusiastic about helping other people. And if you can use a mechanism such as, for instance, to their most base routes, motorsport, cars, community, because that's effectively what it is. It's using a, um, they use a, a common interest to build a community around which then allows people to network and opens up job opportunities. If you can do it in an intelligent way like that, then you'll get people engaged rather than just saying you should do good things for, for instance, a veteran community, wounded, injured, sick. Yeah, but why? How? Get people interested um, and then they'll engage. Um, yeah, so that's what I've done in the last week. Will, will you pull that mic down just slightly for me? You are. Is that better? You, no, down. Down. Yeah, down. That's down. Like, yeah, yeah. You, just, you, you have a very powerful voice, James. Sorry, I'm not sorry. I understand. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, I'll look, fingers crossed for you with that. Thanks. You kind of put him on the spot now, haven't you? Yeah, but he knows that. We have yeah. this, and he won't affect him. He won't affect, it's like his, remotely because his he ego, his ego will protect him. <gasps> <gasps> oh, James <laughs> Cameron. Ego. <laughs> Crikey, he's a he's a busy man. As is the team, they're a, they're a good bunch. Yeah, they're a really good bunch. Yeah, they are a good bunch. Now, yeah, they make an awesome organisation. We last met at Silverstone. Remember Silverstone uh, National oh, yeah. Careers Event last. That was last a good year. event. That. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good event. Yeah, part of the team that planned it. Thank you very much. There you go. Good people there. What else do you want to talk about? Um, well, have you got anything else you, you want to talk about? I've no, got, you know, it's, I've got a few things. No, I, I'm, I'm happy for you. For you're you the to... kind of man, right? You're the kind of man. You're like a, a friend of mine, another friend called Stefan Hool, okay? And Stefan, I, uh, I predicted that he would turn up with a list, a, a, a list like an agenda yeah. of things. Like no one's done that before. I think maybe one person, and he did. He turned up with pages. He wanted to talk, and I'm not bothered by that. It yeah. just hi, it's highly amusing when it's so people turn up to do an interview, and generally they're a little bit nervous, unless they're like you know like a, a celeb or something, or really used to media stuff, or like a businessman or whatever, mm. and they're slightly nervous. And and Stefan has not done this one of these before. And yet he turned up like, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. <laughs> and he got toward, and then there's a point where we need to start wrapping this up. We need to start wrapping this up now. You know, yeah. we, and, and, and he wouldn't let it stop. So we continued for another 45 minutes because he hadn't got through his list. <laughs> Mate, incredible. You've had a list. You've got a list of new. There, you've got bullet points. Come on. There are bullet on, points then. in my head. Yeah. Go on then. Let's do it, mate. Well, what do you want to know? Oh, fuck off. Listen, what, fuck off. Right. So, okay. You've got me swearing at 10 a.m. <laughs> Okay, um, where do, okay so, so you're the interviewer. Where do we start? There are things in my head that uh, there are, who am I? Where am I from? What did I do? Your military service in intrigues me. Okay. Right. You Let's started on the ground. Yes. You ended up with, with, as, a, as a qualified pilot. Yes. Okay. What were you doing when you were on the ground? I, you weren't a tanky, were you? No. Right, go on. I apologize for that, by the way. That's okay. Um, James Cameron would take 
great grievance against that as well. Um, no, so, yeah, so basically, uh, James Griffin joined the army in 2001 into the Household Cavalry Regiment. Um, I never went on the horses, so you can throw all the horse jokes that you want. If you want, I'm, I'm immune to them. Um, and basically, in the middle of basic training, they said, you're going to go Knightsbridge on the horses. I said, I don't want to go on horses. They said, why? I said, because I want to be a helicopter pilot. And they said, well, you joined the wrong regiment. I said, no, I haven't. I know exactly what I'm doing. This is the age of 17. And bless him, Phil Adams, my uh, section commander at Purbright, he was like, you have joined the wrong reg regiment. I said, no, I haven't. I said, I'm going to go reconnaissance. And I'm going to eventually become a crew commander. And then in about eight, nine years, I'm going to apply to be a helicopter pilot. He went, you've got this all mapped out, haven't you? I said, yeah. He says, but you're 17. I said, don't worry, this plan's been in motion since I was 12. So when I was 12 years old, my, um, my dad, uh, in the mid-90s, recorded a, on VHS uh, a, uh, a documentary on BBC called Flying Soldiers. And it was a several-part documentary, mid-90s, so it's, it's that kind of very stern, po face type um, <laughs> documentary. Very serious. And uh, about the Army Echo Pilot course. Watched it as a 12-year-old and went, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. No ifs, no buts, that's what I'm going to do. Looked into it, and bearing in mind, when I was 12 years old, I was, I don't know if you ever saw it, there was a, a four-folder binder kind of like, you know, every week you collect from the news agents this, this um, you build them up into binders, and it'd be an issue, one issue a week, called In Combat. Uh, and it was about... They were like encyclopedias, weren't they? Yes, it was, Encyclopedias yeah. of yeah, knowledge, yeah, 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 and yeah, you yeah. get an, another page or yeah, another yeah, part yeah, yeah, of it yeah, yeah. slot in. And these they were cool. These were really in-depth um, uh, piece of information about the British Army and all of its tactics, all of its operations, weapon systems, you name it. And after a couple of years, my dad had all four, four binders full. Um, and while all my mates were reading uh, football magazines, I was studying up on the HKG-111 and the Steyr AUG, etc. Is your dad ex-military? Uh, so my dad was police and uh, was in what is now the reserves. Um, okay. So he was police and then Royal Military Police in his spare time. He just was policing. Um, I couldn't steal things from the from the biscuit tin because instantly he'd come out with the you know the fingerprint dust, and he'd be like, "Well, they're not my fingerprints, and they're not your sister's fingerprints." So there's only one other person left, and I was like, "No see, other child." Did he really do that? Oh, you did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, no other child has to deal with this. <laughs> this is outrageous. This is an abuse of power. <laughs> but it, it, it made me... So I think that kind of behaviour... And I'm going off on a tangent. I will bring it back. But it made me start to have to think in new ways. Even as a young child, it's like, how do I get around this? And anyway, so I think that's where the recce element started to come into my head. Like, you've got to think about these things first. Anyway, so I was reading these binders. And I'm like, I'm going to join the army. I want to be a helicopter pilot. I knew I wasn't going to join as an officer because my attention span is that of a newt. Um, I didn't enjoy school, didn't really like it, didn't want to be an officer, uh, didn't want to have to go to college. I was like, I'm going to leave, leave school, join the army. Uh, six months after leaving school, join the army. I was like, I'm going to be a helicopter pilot. I'm going to join the Household Cover Regiment because I, wa I was suckered into, so I was suckered into um, joining the army by an advert on the back end of a, a video uh, that I got from... Uh, from the local video store. Uh, and I knew it was armour that I wanted to go into because I saw a chieftain driving through a blockade of scrap cars. I was like, that looks cool. I'm going to do that whilst I'm waiting to be a helicopter pilot. Looked into armour, wanted to be reconnaissance. That looks cool. Asked around who the best reconnaissance regiment, House of Cover Regiment. Right, cool, I'll go and join them. Where are the base? Windsor, brilliant. Let's do that. Already mapping my way to becoming a helicopter pilot. Went to Windsor. Driver, gunner, anti-tank operator, crew commander. Iraq, twice, Afghanistan, blah. The last tour I did in Afghanistan was a forward air controller, and it gave me a really, really good insight into the, uh, into the aviation world. And, and so our role was Brigade Reconnaissance Force, um, and so we were cutting about, doing some fairly punchy stuff, really good highs, utterly miserable lows, Came back from that and went, right, now is the time I'm going to be a helicopter pilot. Came a uh, went on grading, passed the interviews. I was like, I keep passing these various stages that you have. 
like, well, let's just roll with it. This is going really well. Came back, knew when I came back from Afghan, mm, things weren't necessarily right. But it was just like, of course it's not going to be right. You've, you've had to deal with a lot of shit. As, the, the same as so many of us have done. So just kind of get on with it. Um, and I was very lucky enough to have a supportive family, etc. Uh, and my girlfriend and her wife. Uh, and then two and a half years later, in 2014, got, uh, got wings. I was like, oh my God. It's like the last household cavalry guy that got wings was another ginger forward air controller who went by the name of Prince Harry. I was like, following in some decent footsteps here. This is all right. Um, and then decided I wanted to go my first uh, posting onto Belton 2 in Kenya, flying the twin engine Huey, which is amazing. You know, doing, doing medevac stuff. Did that. Uh, then I went and flew Gazelle. Um, and then a few years later, in like September 2017, I was like, I don't feel quite right anymore. Had a really tough year. Um, and uh, yeah, I had, went and saw the doctor, and that was it. Well, are you flying tomorrow? Yeah, no, you're not. You're grounded. And that was the last time I flew a, I flew a helicopter. Um, and from that point, you know, 18 months off work, uh, got medically discharged. Um, and then went to work for Mission Motorsport. And so it's a kind of a, a racing through a timeline there. But how did I end up where I am? That's how. I didn't realise what you'd met so shortly after that, uh, that the emergence of that of the mental health issue. I didn't realise that. I knew that when we met, when we, I can't remember where it was where you first met, I knew that, uh, you mentioned there about um, you were finding this so hard. And you mentioned it over time. Mm. Um, just occasionally when we talk. I didn't realise, mate. I didn't, I, so that's not long ago, James. <laughs> no, it's not. That's not long ago. Well, do you know what? It feels long enough ago for it to be a significant chunk in the past. It's recent <laughs> enough to be a reasonably regular reminder to go, you're doing all right. You're doing all right. In, in comparison to where you could be, you're doing well because of the choices that you've made and the choices that other people have helped you make through coaching, um, which has been utterly key in keeping head above water. Now, don't get me wrong. The nose has gone below water occasionally and it almost feels like you're drowning a little bit. Um, I was on medication for a, a good period of time. Middle of last year, I, I decided I had enough, came off that, and talk about resort withdrawal symptoms from coffee. That was one of the hardest weeks of, of my life when I just I just went not taking antidepressants anymore. And talk about headaches, because I'd been on them for a period of time, and there's a whole deeper, bigger story about how I got on those, when I was at DCMH, you know, I was down in Tidworth at, at Tedworth House, etc. And um, because I'd been moved from from Miami Air Corps Post into Tidworth, so I could be looked after in the DCMH. Um, and I always resisted medication, so don't need it, don't want it. If I feel bad, I'll go and walk my dog, or I'll go and ride my <coughs> motorbike. I had a Triumph Street Triple R at the time, Arrow Exhaust, amazing. Um, but it got to the point where my frustrations grew and grew that walking the dog wasn't doing it. Doing fizz wasn't doing it. Riding my motorbike, I was looking at the front face of an Eddie Stobart thinking, let's just do this. I thought, that, you know, and, and then you, you find yourself at the side of the road looking at your motorbike going, I can't ride this thing anymore because the only thing, it, it's, it's incre I know what it's doing. I'm twisting my wrist to go faster, to get that hit, to make me feel alive somehow, and it's going to kill me. Stefan Hull, mate. Funny you should mention that. Stefan Hull's the same thing. Just on a complete, really? on, just on a complete, you know, on, on a motorbike, just like he got to a point where he was just, um, he was just going as fast as he could and, and almost, I think, almost subconsciously hoping it would go pear-shaped because he ain't surviving going at that speed. Yeah. Sorry, don't know. Go on. No, it's all right. Um, and that's the thing. And I think, and this all, where does that, so I always kind of like go, oh, let's do a deep dive. I hate the phrase, but let's dive, dive deeper into that. Why was I doing that? I was doing it because I wanted to feel as alive as I had in a previous point in time. 
I needed that adrenaline hit. I want, it's kind of why I enjoyed, for me, that's what I wanted. I enjoyed flying because it made me feel alive. It made me feel, when it started to make me feel mundane, I knew my concentration levels were going elsewhere and there were other factors that were affecting it. So, and that was all part of the decision process of, I need to go and see the doctor because something isn't right. I remember one of the last times I got in a helicopter, started it up, I was moving it from one part of the airfield to the other. The rotors were turning and I couldn't remember anything that I'd just done in the starter procedure and I was on my own. And I thought, I'm not fit to fly this aircraft. So it was bang, 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 off, rotor brake on, got out. I was like, I'm not doing this. I shouldn't be in this aircraft. Went home and, you know, decided I was going to go see the doctor. Um, and so I, I digress. So, yeah, so with that whole behavior with the motorbike, that bearing in mind, this was about a year later, it was coming back and I thought, I'm supposed to be on a road to recovery here. I'm not getting... Three years ago. Four now. Okay. Yeah, so 2017. Um, and I thought, and, and for context, DCMH, District Central Mental Health, for anyone who doesn't know, DCMH is where you go in the military for mental health um, help quite common to a lot of people nowadays. Um, I was having what I would call a suboptimal experience at DCMH, to put it politely. And I felt myself getting worse. Um, and so at that point, you know, when I was on my motorbike, I went, right, you need to stop, reset, take control of your life. Um, and so I told him, I said, right, this is, this has gone far enough, send me to med board. Um, and I was fighting to stay in the army and, and, and I apologize I realize we've gone backwards and forwards in the timeline here but I am um, I needed control of my life um, because you know when you get that feeling of floating you're in limbo and you don't know whether you're gonna I was fighting to stay in the army I wanted to save my career it just so happened that what for whatever reason it just wasn't meant to be it wasn't meant to be and the longer I tried to hold on it's like holding onto a onto a cliff face with your fingernails. You can only hold on for so long before the strain becomes unbearable. And you go, right, I I either pull myself up now and incur a bit of pain just to get that bit <coughs> further up, or I'm just gonna let go and, and I'm gonna free fall and I don't know for how long. I'm gonna go through the clouds, I could hit the floor in, in 10 seconds in a day, I don't know. And so I took control, and it was one of the most powerful things you can do, is just going, right, I'm taking control of the situation. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, so relatively recent, yes, but it feels like a long time ago. Uh, yeah, it does. Good. Yeah, it does. Do you think I, uh, sorry, I know I've just thrown a lot at you there. No, 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 it's fine. Um, I didn't No, So when I think about, you were talking about adrenaline rush and trying to regain that adrenaline rush, mm. right? One of the things I, I, I've, I think now when I think about that is that when, when people are looking for that adrenaline rush, it might be a different case for you because you'll see why in a minute, but and I'm not a fucking doctor, but people go looking for that adrenaline, especially ex-military, and they miss, they miss being in. And people who served during particularly volatile times or served on volatile operations, or just served on fucking operations, right? Mm. They often, as, as I did, at one uh, during one period, is I look back and think, this is an early period actually. I I want to be back there. I I I want to be back in Afghanistan. I want to be back on the ground. I want to be mm. back doing that. That's where I'm comfortable. That's what I want to do. And and sometimes, a lot of the time, people look at that and go, "You want the adrenaline rush? That's what you want. You want that fear. You want that not fear. You want the um, just that. You want that fucking black and white life that." simple decisions complex situations that simple simple decision and thought processes and be uh and and i'm doing that shit again right but yeah. you know what i think it is i don't think, i don't think it's because of the adrenaline i don't think it's because of um the, your life's at risk i don't think it's because of that mm. i think that that's what we think of it as but a lot of the t that we think it is but a lot of the time it's not that it's the everything that goes along with those situations the sense of value you get 
with your uh, in in that community of people you're with, your place in society, your your your, your value within. I'm on the military, obviously. Your value there, your experiences. It's very simple. You are no closer to being purely in touch with your mental and physical abilities and your emotional awareness is no sharper at any time than when your life is at risk okay and it it's almost like the the best kind of uh community the best kind of society the best kind of life that is valuable to you from interpersonal relationships to to the the way you go about and do things and knowing what you have to do in mission and task and all of that right it is that the best example of that is those situations life or death situations um and that's what i think is missed and that's what i think i missed uh when i was thinking about that it's just some, not I, I not that i was thinking i missed anything but when i was trying to understand why the fuck do i want to go back there why do i want to go back there so much and i didn't think that at the time but it was that retrospectively why did i want to go back there so much and that's what i think it is it's not the adrenaline i think it's everything that comes with that but the adrenaline is the obvious one the life and death is the obvious one it's not that it's all of the pieces that come with it that's what you miss and the key thing about that james is I'm not su- sorry. I'm not suggesting it that was you, is you, okay? But the key thing about that is, if that is right, and it's all those other little bits and pieces that you miss, mm. those can absolutely be replicated mm. healthily. You can get that stuff. You don't have to put your life on the fucking line. You you don't have to do it. You don't have to be going 140 mile an hour, 200 mile an hour on a motorbike, for example. You know. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and you've just hit. You've you've basically. So what you've just done is taken taken from where I was at that moment on the motorbike to where I am now. And, you, and you've, you've explained it very well. At that moment in time, I firmly believed I just wanted to feel alive. I didn't know how, and I only, re- I only thought that the only way to do it is to get adrenaline. What you've just kind of expanded on, and if you'll allow me to also, is I've now found that, that, Everything that goes with it, what makes me feel better, what makes me feel alive, what makes me feel valued, and everything that you just, into one package, is, is coaching. Now, I never, ever, ever saw that coming. Why coaching? Because it makes me feel like a useful human being who can bring value to other people. What do you mean coaching? Explain what you, what you mean. Coaching, right, so... Uh, what does a coach mean to you? Someone says, "What's coach?" What? What do you? What, how would you describe a coach? Oh, it's uh, it's somebody who is able to help somebody else or a group of people get better at a thing. Yeah, nuts and bolts of it. <laughs> so basically, okay. Uh, what have I? So I have basically taken it upon myself that my future vocation is going to be. A coach, not a football coach, not a basketball coach, not a hockey coach, a coach. If you can coach football, you can coach basketball. It is the mechanism and the method that you do it. Why? Because it helps people improve their situation. And when you do things like that, you you become engaged in a kind of community sense. And when you partner up with somebody who wants to achieve something or move their life on in a certain way, but almost feels like they've hit a barrier, helping them get over that barrier is incredibly powerful. And then the hit you get after that, you know, you end the Zoom call or you end the, the coaching call and you're like, we, we got somewhere with that. Your energy level shoots up and then you go, my God, I have found a reason to be now. I found something that I can do that I enjoy doing. I enjoy talking to people. I, I love conversations. I love taking something and pulling it apart and go, well, let's look at that in more depth, which something in my military career generally got me into trouble. It's like, Griff, do this. I'm like, yeah, okay, but why? No, no, why? Okay, how? Just do it. Yeah, but there's, I think there's a better way of doing it. No, do this. I'm like, mm. like, why are you being awkward? I'm not being awkward. I'm just pulling it apart. See if we get, just do it. Okay, fine. It sounds to but, me like you're being awkward. It sounds to me like... <laughs> Because you're a binary <laughs> creature, Hugh. It's a good point you're on about that. Just, just to go back. So yeah. we'll come. Sorry, I just okay. want to just jump in because I forget otherwise. Is that uh, on the mental health thing? So 
um, is the you 100% right root cause analysis, right? And that sounds to people who've never heard the term before. It's like it sounds complicated. No, that's not. It, when you're talking about anything, you're trying to identify what's causing it, especially with the mental health stuff. When you first realise that, uh, um, yeah, I might have a drama. Yeah, I'm, I'm not optimal. Mm-hmm. I'm operating at a suboptimal level, right? Then we people barely even ask themselves the first way. Or well, they may ask themselves the first way. Why don't we like this? If they even ask it. Once you find out that, you think you're like that, then go to the next one. Why? You go, why, 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 why? All the way back. And that's what brings you to the pieces of the puzzle that will help you move forward in anything. Especially in the mental health. Ask yourself why you're feeling shit that day. Then ask yourself why that why has happened. And it goes mm. back, back. Five ways. Go for the five ways. Anyway, go on. So you're talking about going backwards. What I'm talking about is going forwards. And when you go forwards, you try not to ask why, more how. So rather than why do you want to do that, it's like, okay, you have said to me you want to do this, so let's do that. How do we get there? And if someone goes, I don't know, okay, what options are available to you? And then you have this conversation that, so the analogy I will use is imagine, imagine you've got two people. You've got one person in a fairly dark room or a confused room. And then you've got another person stood opposite them in a doorway. And the other person, the coach, is stood in a really wide, long corridor, really spacious. Loads and loads of doors in that corridor. And the coachee is in this room. There's no other way out other than that doorway. They want to get out, but they don't know how. They want to explore the other doorways, but they don't know how. Now, if you throw ideas at this one person in the, in, in the room, this, this coachee, and you tell them how to do it, and then you bring it upon yourself to walk into this room, and you make yourself this this big character, and you go, I know how you should do this, I know how you should do that. How would you as that person in that room feel? And why, why, what the fuck do you know? That's how I'd feel. You, you'd feel imposed upon, you'd feel yeah. comfortable in my personal space. Rather, reset to position one, the coach, stands there anywhere they want, somewhere within, it can be within visual range, just audible range, and just asks a series of questions that allows that person to, in their own time, walk out of that room. And you offer all these doors up to them. It's like, these doors are all yours. This is your corridor. Where do you want to go? I'm not going to tell you how to do this. I'm going to ask you challenging questions with your permission because that's part of the process, but at the start, you, 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 you have an agreement. How do you want this process to work? Are you happy for me to ask you challenging questions? Uh, this isn't counselling, by the way. You know, the moment that this this uh, this experience turns into counselling, we kind of put a stop to it and we go right. This is something that perhaps you might want. But coaching isn't meant to be a particularly easy process because you're going to experience things that. As the coachee, the barriers are always going to be things that, or often, are things that you don't really want to approach. You know you really need to. But how we approach them, navigate them, it's like doing a close target recce. There's something there I need to look at. But I need to pedal around it. And eventually I'll find, and I'll get a picture of it and go, ah, now I know how, if I want to approach that, that's how I'll approach it. it it's same principle and so once that person's happy to step out of the room which door do you want to go through well i want to go through that door because i know what's in there that's easy Mm, but that one's a bit difficult okay you happy to go through it now Mm, not quite ready right what about that one never want to go through that one we definitely need to talk about that one one day but let's get into a comfort zone and it goes through session after session after session before they go, I've opened up most of the doors in this room. I now know what the options are available to me. I know which ones I really want to do. And then at the end, you go, okay, right, where's your will? On a scale of one to 10, one being nothing, 10 being absolutely 100% committed. Where's the will to do this? Oh, eight. Okay, cool. That's great. Or five. That's cool. How do we find the remainder five or two? And they go, oh, well, actually, I can do this. Brilliant. Now we're firing on all cylinders. And that's how athletes do it. That's how CEOs, you know, entrepreneurs, et cetera, do it. And these are people who regularly, people like Jeff Bezos almost certainly will have a coach because he knows that in order to unlock that final 5 or 
that's going to get him ahead of where he wants to be, he needs an outside voice or helping hand to unlock it. You don't offer solutions. You simply facilitate a conversation where that other person comes up with the, with the solutions. And I know this works because I've been coached to within an inch of my life, A, in therapy and, and also in flying training. That was a fit. I thought coaching, when, when it was suggested to me in flying training, was very pink and fluffy. You'll not be surprised that it was the RAF who, who suggested it, the tri series environment. You fail a sortie, right, why don't you go and see a performance coach? I don't need to see a coach. I'm a steal the ideal of a death. I just, I just do things, don't I? And I'm like, just go and speak to the coach. And then you speak to the coach, and suddenly you realise, well, I didn't have a good night's sleep last night. I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I got out of routine. All the way, all the holes in the cheese line up, I end up with a rubbish sortie. So I failed it. How do I recover it? So that's what I'm doing. I'm going down the International uh, Coaching Federation ACC accredited route in about a year, hopefully be uh, accredited, and then I can put a big stamp next to my name and go, I know, I've because it's a chunk of money that you, you, you put down to invest, because it's an investment in yourself. The conversations I now have with my wife are significantly different. Arguments are, are probably down 50% which is brilliant, but she also knows when I'm trying to coach her now. So I'll try and get cheeky coaching sessions in. <laughs> and she'll be like, I can see what you're doing and I know what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, but it's free training. I need it. Um, but that's the great thing. And part of the training is you have to coach a certain number of people over a certain period of time. And I can't take any more on now. It's amazing how many people go, I'll do that. And the results you see in people are amazing. Well, I love the I love the sound of it. It's like I, I I love the sound of it. I love the idea of it. It's definitely something I would do one hundred percent. But uh, no, there's no but. Um, but you are, you're a person who likes to help people. It's obvious, right? And you're just you're just you're just. I mean, doing that professional coaching course. That's just you refining how you help people and your abilities, right? Mm. And formalizing it. And like you said, it's like a, a guarantee of quality of uh, a guarantee of quality for the person being coached. Because what you don't want as a coach is a flipping moron. There are so many people out there who call themselves coaches. And who am I to say that they are not coaches? However, the coaching industry is highly unregulated. There is no official governing body in the UK, in the world, that says we are the law when it comes to coaching. There is, however, the largest group, this, the largest body that is reasonably unargu unarguably the most respected the icf and it's it's where all the major master coaches etc all share best practice and any coaching course that <coughs> you're doing should be icf accredited now there are people out there who argue and go it's unregulated i don't need to have accreditation fine but for me for my due diligence if i'm going to offer my services as a coach to somebody in the future i want them to have the confidence that i have put myself through a significant amount of education and training that refines what I already have, which I think are people skills, and has then refined them with this toolkit that you learn on this course and through this education period of taking your pre-existing assumptions and turn them around. I thought I could coach people before this. I could talk to people before this. Now, I know how to use, or I'm continuing to learn how to use questions for people to come up with their own answers. There's a difference between telling somebody how to do it and asking them what they want to do. The end objective might be the same. How they get there is significant. If I tell you to do something and you go and do it, will you have the same uh, a ch sense of achievement than if you had come up with the idea yourself. So that's what it's all about. And it's really powerful. And when you see someone come up with something that the light goes on, and all you've done is just facilitate them to get there. And I think that's very powerful. And I think that is how we develop as a society because it allows you to communicate people in a certainly non-confrontational -confront way. Um, 
because when you start to tell people how to do things, there's certain places where that, that I suppose, has a place. The military, in you know, in some certain situations, do it because there's no time for question now. Get that. But if you're... Yeah, I suppose... I'm, lost my sense of lost track now no it's all right no it makes sense mate like I said, it, is, it sounds really valuable I've not you know I know of um, I know of a couple of coaches uh, but it's never something I can consider but the way you've explained it yeah I, I it has huge value 100% I mean it's you need if you think whatever you're doing that you can be, achieve not perfection but as close to the perfection as you want to achieve by not taking in any other perspectives or information or opinions you're not going to do it and um and that's the importance of this i think granted you're not telling people but you're you're asking you're asking questions based on your experience with stuff and based on your perspective on what the coachee is thinking or wants because they've told you and that's different to what their perspective is which shows in different doors sometimes. The questions you're asking them are not based on your personal experience. It's more like, okay, have you got a goal? Is this somewhere you want to be? Yes. Okay. How do you achieve it? And they go, don't know. Okay. What would success look like to you? And then suddenly there's a real long pause. And they go, oh, crikey. Um, I don't know, I suppose. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, I'd have a big house, I'd have, you know, uh, a flash car. Okay, cool. Is, if that's success to you, how do you get there? <coughs> oh, I don't know, because I work in Tesco's. Okay. Is it achievable? Well, not right now. How do we make it achievable? Oh, right. Well, I suppose I need more money. Okay. What is the goal here? Is it money? Or is it the house? Or is it something deeper? And nine times out of ten, you go, this person just wants to be happy. They just want to be happy. Happiness will get, it will. It opens up so many other doors because your capacity opens. Um, and so, uh, for instance, a powerful question is, if you knew the answer, what would it be? Say that again. If you knew the answer, <laughs> just if, if you knew the answer, <laughs> What would it be? And suddenly a really long pause kicks in. And they go, oh my God. Well, I suppose the answer would be this, but, right. So what about that but? How do we address the but? Oh, right. Well, well I suppose I could address... And suddenly you're in. <laughs> You've almost broken the matrix. It's like this answer you never thought you had is there. It is there. And there's a way of getting in. We just have to find the right door. Another one. How old are you? Are you actually asking me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 39. 39. How would 49-year-old Hugh tell you to approach this goal? And then suddenly you go, oh, my God. Well, I suppose I would have this knowledge and that knowledge and then... When you look at yourself in the mirror, especially an older version, you can see yourself where you want to be. It's like you've already achieved this goal. So actually, I would do this, do that, do that. You're not telling this person how to do it. They're just looking at things from a significantly different point of view. And it's incredibly powerful. So not the door then? <laughs> I think someone did. Did they? Might have done. I don't know. Thanks, so. everyone. So yeah, so that's what coaching is all about. Um, and they're really fun sessions. Sometimes it can go, get quite serious. Sometimes you can have an absolute scream. But you do it over a, a period of, say, one-hour sessions. You might do eight, you might do ten, whatever. Until that person goes, I know what I'm doing now. You go, okay, cool. And I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it. Is that why you went looking for the postman? job something routine and uh, predictable so you could mm. it, as it that enabler of yeah. to do the other stuff i know what my goal is my goal is to one day be competent and qualified enough i want to be a master coach 
in 10 years, 10, 15 years, I want to be a master coach. I want to have had over 2,000 hours worth of coaching experience under my belt so that I can do that. In my, I, I want to be able to only have to do three sessions a week per month so that I don't have to, I'm free to do everything else I want to do. I want to live on the Scottish borders. I want to have a bit of land. I want to rescue donkeys. I want to rescue dogs. I want to rescue llamas. And that's where, that's where my ultimate goal is. So how do I get there? I do a job that I enjoy doing that I can do from anywhere. What is that? Coaching. Why? Because I enjoy doing it. How do I get there? Well, I, edu I come down a step. I educate myself. I get experience. What can I do in between that? Well, I get a job that pays the bills, that gives me the space and time to do this. When you break it down into processes, it makes sense. And I only know that this works because I have been through that process. And if I can pass that on to other people, the world's a wonderful place, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's what and, I'm trying to and it's, and it, Yeah, and it's, I, it, you, you, also don't have the, you also don't have that misconception that there's not enough time because you've already had a career. You're whatever age you are, right? And you think, I ain't got enough time. When you, le when you finish whatever you're doing uh, and you, I don't know, let's say it's the military, obviously, 22, 25 years, whatever. I mean, I was, I was speaking to an EOD operator yesterday who has been in, he is in, for 27 years. He's out mm. next year. And, you know, that's got to bring on some anxiety, right? Um, but, man, you get out at what? For, between 40 and 50 years old. Like, life expectancy is 80, 90 now for us. Mm. You've got a whole other career in you. You can achieve a whole other career and still retire at the retirement age. You can do it. It's like you can absolutely reset yourself and go, okay, this is my second bash at a career, except this time I'm a fucking adult and I know the way the world works. And I'm going to go, bang, yep. this is what I'm doing. I know all the pieces of the puzzle. I'm more switched on. I know what education is available to me. I know what I can use to my, to my advantage. And let's, let's go for it. What am I going to be in life? So as a society... We, we look at 40 years old like it's old. I know. But that's because a long time ago, that used to be about five to ten years before you pop your clogs. <laughs> yeah. That's not the case anymore. We're going to live longer lives. And, the, you know, there is, a, there is a massive health push at the moment. People are going to start living better <laughs> lifestyles that will give them longer lives. 40, you're only halfway through your working life. I, I'm not retiring at 67. I know that. You probably won't retire at 67. We're going to work longer and longer and longer. And so how do you spend that time best? Um, and I think the view, the point of view that I have, that I find really useful, it's quite liberating actually, is I've already achieved my dream. My dream was to be a helicopter pilot. And I've done it. And I don't do it anymore. And the weird thing that I always had, that I had to come to terms with was what do I do next? Someone says, What's your dream job? And I went, it's a helicopter pilot and I've done it. I don't want to do anything else, but I can't do that now. So what do I do? And it's like, your, your slate is completely blank. Helicopter pilot is not an option because you don't, you're not going to do it again. It's just, it's that simple. So what do you want to do? It's like, <laughs> I want to talk to people for a living. Okay, what does that look like? Oh, and then someone said, you, I think you make a good coach. Someone else said it, I went, I've thought about that, go down that route. Suddenly, I found something I enjoy doing. And it changes the way that you talk to people. And I think having that view on the rest of your life being one way you can take this second. It's like 40, you can change your career at 40. You can change your career at 50. How you do it is entirely up to you. And that's why I think coaching is going to become something more common. Because in order to get there, in order to unlock our entrenched behaviours and beliefs, because a lot of this comes down to belief systems, like where do I see myself in the world? Well, I think I should be, I should be going in at this level or manager, CEO level, blah, blah, blah. Why can't you go at that level? Why does, why does anyone have to, do, do you care how other people see you? Or are you, are you just happy about how you see yourself? Because ultimately, we all think that everybody is thinking about us all the time, and they're not. They're thinking about them. And so actually, I don't really care if, if someone goes, you used to be a helicopter pilot, but now you're a postman. Funnily enough, I'm not even a postman now. But they go, how have you gone from there to there? And it's like, well, because that's where I wanted to go. 
and it's making that and I, I just think being able to achieve what you want is the most important thing and bugger everybody else but help people at the same time yeah yeah absolutely and you need to be a, a big one is I don't think people are you know that, that looking out and worrying, what, worrying about what other people think of them it's because they ain't happy with themselves or they, aren't con or they aren't content and it's not because they shouldn't they shouldn't be happy mm -hmm. or content with themselves because they've not sort of analysed themselves and gone who am I am I happy with who I am and that has recently dawned on me I, I've got this thing called uh, the mind journal mm -hmm. you heard of the mind journal yeah, yeah. Mate Ash Fletcher who he told me about it Ash Fletcher I have to give him a shout right Ash is X216. He's 26 years old, right? 26, mate. And he is the most rigid, like now, he is the most rigidly, he's a rigid person, super disciplined with mindfulness and well being. Mm. And he brought it about, uh, he brought, I, I think, he, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, I no doubt I'll get a text. He, he, it was brought about, this way he's doing things now was brought about because he wasn't operating on a very, he was operating suboptimally. Mm. Um, and realised it at that age, young lad at that age, and he is living, he, he has got, the, I think he's nailed it perfectly, he enjoys his life, he's super disciplined, he does well at work, and he's, uh, he's not overindulging in things, he's just, he's just like the perfect example of it, at that age as well, just key, but in that, fucking hell, anyway, going back from uh, blowing smoke at Ash's ass, the mind journal, I've got, I'm pointing to the bag, because I've got yeah, the yeah, bag yeah. there, <laughs> It goes everywhere with me. I, I, look, I fill it in daily. And it was one thing in the, the other day, and it's, it, it prompts the question each morning. And this one was, um, it was something like, are, are you content with who you are? Mm. And it, it's some other point is in there to think about who you are. And I, was, I, started, I started thinking, I, I am happy with who I am. And I was literally sat there and thought, this is the fucking greatest day ever. I, I am happy with who I am. You know, because you, life's an evolution, right? Your personality is an evolution. The way you exist, the way you do things is an evolution. And we're not all perfect. And I definitely haven't been perfect in the past, 100%. But it's about who you are now. And even if I'm, even if in that I'd read that, even if, like, maybe listen to this, and you think, I ain't happy with who I am. But it's good that you said that because you've identified areas for improvement. This is what I, I do. Uh, I do project management as a day job. And I love having challenge. I love challenging projects, right? Don't get me wrong. It can be very stressful, but I love it things with lots of problems because what if you know the lots of problems what that means is there's lots of room for improvement there's mm. lots of room for improvement and you always want to be improving you know and and uh it's yeah be ha like that's got to be first and foremost be happy with who you are are you happy with who you are now not what you've got not what you want to have but who you are as a person now are you happy with that good step one done mark australius i might be wrong mind you're the coach not me i might be talking shit <laughs> We're all coaches in training. But he, um, you read The Daily Stoic, don't you? Yeah. Amazing book. Yeah. I cannot recommend it yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, and one of the quotes, obviously, Marcus Aurelius, um, former emperor of the Roman Empire, um, wrote in Meditations. One of the things that he writes is, and I'm paraphrasing, when you find yourself wanting more, pause take a look around you, see what you have, and imagine how much you would want all of that stuff if you didn't have it. So imagine you, you think, I want, I want a massive studio to do my podcast. But Hugh, pause, take a look around you. Look at this cabin. Look at all the kit you've got. Fucking cabin. It's a, it's a very nice cabin. It's a studio. Call it cab Thank you. All right. Cabin. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Right. See, see this flow that you're on, Griff? There you go. <laughs> I'm just going to chop it in half. <laughs> but just to look around and see what you've got. It, and it's amazing. So be happy with what you have. Um, and I think nowadays we are all guilty of, of looking at social media and going, they've got more than I've got. It's an age-old problem. Keeping up with the Joneses. We all do it. But when you can take that pause and go, I'm quite happy with what I've got, it's very, very powerful. But beware of plateauing. Go on. You talk about self-progress and moving on and, and uh, continually improving yourself. When you walk, when, for instance, I'll bring it back to a military term, when you're, when you're tabbing up a hill, 
and you think, ah, oh, there's the top, and actually you've just reached a false summit. Like, oh, God. But that false summit almost is like a plateau. Now, if you just stay at that plateau, and you go, quite comfy here, I'm just going to stay here. Quite happy with my job, quite happy with my life, etc. <coughs> but you know there's more in you. You know you want to get to the top of that mountain. You go, mm, that's going to take a lot of effort. Okay, fine, it's going to take a lot of effort, but what are you going to achieve by staying here? Now, a lot of people will go, I'm quite happy staying on this plateau, that's fine. But remember, it's your decision to stay on that plateau. And when you see walking, people walking past you, and the old lady who's been walking up these mountains her entire life with the sticks, goes waltzing past, and is just breathing normally, and you're catching your breath, and she reaches the top of that mountain before you, don't be angry at the old lady. Don't be angry at whoever it is who's just what or the leagues of people that have walked past you to get to the top of that mountain. Because you told yourself you're going to stay there. Whereas actually, if you come up with a plan and go, all right, I'll walk up it, but I'll walk up it in stages. Fine, do it in stages. Doesn't have to be a sprint. We're all trying to get somewhere really, really quickly. But what do you do when you get there? It's like, oh, I've got to go somewhere else now. And then it almost taps back into the nomadic part of your brain. We can, to stay in one place is kind of not what we're, what we're wired to do. Now, you can put that into a, a work sense now more than... It's like why people move houses. It's like, I like this house. I've got everything I want. Watch a, a house moving program. I don't watch much TV, but what are these, these programs where they, they go... Um, uh, house in the country or something. And it goes, oh, I don't, they exist. These programs exist. Someone who's listening to this will... No, I don't <laughs> watch much TV. Either. Well, neither do I. But I know there are programs out there where people talk about, oh, I've got a budget of 3.9 million. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Um, okay, excellent. So let's look at where you're living now. And I'm like, holy shit, I'd have the house that they're living in now. And they're like, yeah, but I want to be uh, half a kilometer closer to the train station. So why do people keep moving? Because I think it's it's an ingrained drive to just keep moving now whether they're moving physically or in their career see you know, go on Wait. go on keep talking okay go on but it's this constant motion we're we're wired to be in motion whether it's in your career or whether it's physically i think just knowing where you're where you want to be i i, I can't keep talking now because i really want to know what's going inside your head <laughs> i disagree with you Go for it. <laughs> it. The reason we change our environment yeah. and change other things about us, why don't we have the same partner? Why don't we have the same partner? I do have the same partner. No, no, no. From when you were a kid, right? Not, I don't mean a kid, but from when you're young, why don't we have the same partner? We don't have the, we don't have the same house. We don't. There's loads of things that change. Mm. And, and the house one is, is because, partly because, as we get older and we and, and, and we grow our needs change and our view of things change and our mm. sense of what is valuable and what is not changes and that changes because of you inside or because of external variables yeah like work and stuff like that like so as an example who's that copy i don't know but yeah absolutely i agree but there's a lot of people i think just want to change things for the sake of changing it rather than i, I agree mm, yeah I agree. it's 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 trying to mask something else it's like if i just busy myself with moving a house over here because i really don't want to focus on what i actually really want to do is change my career i change hopefully if i change this it will force me to change this it can almost be a proxy to it so that's where i think the interesting part of it is anyway but that's really deep um but yeah i i was oh, a good point mate it's a good point yeah you you know you, you, you are right this is what you i'm are, talking about yeah, when yeah, you pull things point. apart well how why, why? where and and that, that's also a question I try not to use in coaching, is why. Are you doing it because you're doing it? Are you making this change because you because you need to make this change? Or are, you do, are you making this change because that's just what's done? Because if, yeah. if, if the answer to the latter, then hang on, let's have a think about this. Correct. Let's have a think about this. Yeah. What am I going to benefit from it? Yeah. Am I putting myself through all this stress to do it? What? And because it's nice to know where you're at. It's like the routine's nice. It's nice to know where you're at, what mm. you've got. And, and I mean, the ex house moving example is, you know, just... Just fucking throws up all sorts of stuff. Mm. You're gonna restart, aren't you? Why I do that to yourself. I, I do, do it. it. Yeah, I do it at the moment. I keep saying to my wife, "So when are we moving to Scotland?" 
and then I take a pause and I go, but I really like this house that we're living in. Everything that we have right now, I'm really happy with. But it's because once I've settled with something, I kind of want to change it. But it's like, I don't need to change it. What, what I really want to do is have some value in the community. I want to have some, va I want to feel valued. And if I don't feel that, then I change something else. Whereas actually yesterday, I walked past the Royal British Legion in my local village I didn't know was there. And I was like, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to get involved in Royal British Legion because it's part of my community and I will then feel like I've embedded more into it and I won't be thinking about moving because actually I do like where I live. I want to feel a part of this community because we, for the last 100 years, we've kind of gone away from that community living. Whereas now I think it's becoming a more important part and I think COVID has, has made made that far more obvious to people especially with small businesses etc hopefully hopefully oh hopefully yes hopefully i do you know what walking the dogs the other day walking down the high street and i said to my wife i hope to god we don't go back to the way that we were and i fear we might i fear we might pick up our old habits and forget what's valuable what some of the things that we're supposed to have learned during the pandemic of what's important what if we go back to our old ways what if that's just how we're wired? I don't want it to. Because there's so much potential good to come out of this utter tragedy. But it's human nature, isn't it? In 100 years, we're not going to be here, Hugh. Yeah, I mean, we need to start wrapping up in a minute. But yeah, uh, we're not going to be in 100 years. But to your point, you know, you were talking about a sense of you know, value in the community. And that's like a, that's a fucking, that's a, that's a back in the day when we were just, tribes like cavemen tribes isn't it you, if you weren't valued in the, in, within your tribe well you were going to have a rough life or no life at all mm. you'd be kicked out because you everyone need to have a place to value and maybe and, well definitely over the pandemic i think that uh, those people who have you know who've gone and realized that there are the neighbors in need and mm. old people and vulnerable people who need help and they've gone out of their way now to help them because there's not really any other options so they feel like that sense of again that sense of community Hopefully that's a demonstration of that's how we should do things. You know, it's like we all live together. We're all around each other. We're all here to help each other yeah. if we want to. And granted, not everyone needs help and not everyone wants to give it. Yeah. But I would like to think that, you know, you're living on the street, that I would like to think that at least one or two of the neighbours would help me if I needed help. Mm. Um, before the pandemic, probably not. Now, very different kettle of fish. Very different kettle of fish. I didn't know. I, I've been living in a place where I live now for about a year and a half. And uh, I didn't know all the faces. And that's, I didn't know all the people's names in that street. Mm. That started changing when I was standing outside my door clapping for the NHS. I could then see all the people who lived in those houses and smiles and nods. Just little things like that. You know, I know what you're talking about. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, hopefully things change. Mate, um, we do need to start wrapping up. Yeah. We've got beers this afternoon. Excellent. Um, shameless plug stuff. How do people, so if someone wants to talk to you about coaching, mm -hmm. either to discuss coachee or coaching or whatever, or anything you talked about today, how do they get older again? Easiest. I, uh, the only social media I really do is Instagram. Um, I'm a simple creature. I like pictures. Um, so at James Griffin Coaching uh, on Instagram, and that's it. There are plans for a website. There are plans for doing a blog type stuff, but I'm working at my own capacity at the moment. Uh, and it will come because it's an evolution. Um, but yeah, that's where it is. I literally do not have the capacity to take on any more coaching at the moment. I've set myself a limit. I'm doing it and it's manageable. Um, but in time, uh, the capacity will grow as my education grows. Um, and I thoroughly enjoy it. Yeah. But thank you very much. For, yeah, thank you for having me on. We still didn't address the question about from when we last spoke about why when you leave the army or the military, why your rank does or does not matter going into a civilian job. Do you remember that? Yeah. But mm. we'll leave that for another another time. Yeah, let's let's do it. Let's do it another time when yeah, you're next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't again, mate. You're welcome on any time. Uh, do you know what? I feel uh, when we were talking about this, I thought we're sc we're scratching the surface of so many things that we could just start pulling apart. Um, I'm more than happy to talk about more in detail about my, my military career and actually how it ended up putting me where it put me um, or not or other things. 
there's just so and I'm, don't worry I'm not writing a book so you can have all the all the first access material <laughs> on here. Uh, well, listen, anytime you pass them out of the studio, you, you, or you know you're going to be, let me know, and if we can make it work, we make it work, and we get yeah, you and do yeah, it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, mate. Genuinely enjoyed that, and I and uh, I actually learned a lot. Really appreciate it. Likewise. I enjoy challenging conversations. Was that challenging for you, was it? No, but I could see it challenged you. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> right, mate, it's been a pleasure. Let's get with this. Cheers, cool. you.